Hello everybody, I'm Bill Harris and we welcome you to Life Questions. This is a weekly program offering a biblical perspective on life's issues. And today we have certain topics we'd like to focus in on and those topics include people who are hurting in the church and indeed people who are hurt by the church. The second issue we want to tackle is the rate of pastoral burnout, something that very often leads to suicide among pastors. The third issue, if we have a chance to get to it, is the issue of the Sabbath day and how should that be observed. Let's take a look at our guests for today, introducing them. First of all, we have Pastor Jim King of Ebenezer Mennonite Church of Bluffton, Ohio. Pastor Darwin Dunton of Mount Tabor Church of God in Salina. Pastor Rick Riquet, Riquet, pardon me, Pastor Rick Ricky of Delphus Trinity United Methodist Church. And finally, Pastor Craig Flack. He is of the Salina First Church of God. We welcome all of you to today's program. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We've had some good preliminary discussion, and uh, I, I think some of what we had to say preliminarily should have probably been into <laughs> the taping as well. You were so good. Let me start, first of all, by people who are hurting in the church. Uh, and indeed, this sometimes leads to people leaving the church and, and getting a bad taste in their mouths, not coming back. What, what's leading to this across our country? People that are leaving the church because they feel that they were hurt by the church. Anybody want to start out that, with that question? Well, I think maybe to just jump in is that the church is made up of people and people hurt people. Mm -hmm. You have to understand everybody in the church is human and while we come to church and we uh, d desire to bring out the best in us, that doesn't always happen. And so sometimes that's put on the church and sometimes that's put on God when, when individuals hurt somebody else. Yeah. So we, we got to kind of separate, you, you know, you might have had a particular instance, somebody said something, a, a pastor or an elder or whatever uh, ridiculed you or you felt looked down on because of something. But uh, to impose that on the church and, you know, in the big C understanding, church is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and there's, uh, we can't label God's family that way because we were hurt as an individual. You know, I once heard the saying that hurt people hurt people. Sure, sure you all heard of that. And you've got a lot of people in the church who are less than perfect. This is why you can never find a perfect church because the minute you or I walk in, it won't be perfect anymore. Right. And, and, and because people hurt people, we have a situation where I guess messages need to reflect that so that we teach people that we've got to learn to come to grips with our own problems and um, and not pass them on to somebody else, would you say? And I, I think there's levels of hurt too, and uh, I've heard it expressed sometimes that uh, in this way, is, is people go up the myth tree. The myth the tree? The myth tree, <laughs> and, and it's like, then how do you come down the myth tree when you've been hurt? And I, I think uh, part of that is learning how to forgive. Uh, I think that's a very important part. I mean, I remember very at the important. time uh, Peter asked Jesus, well, how many he was talking about, Jesus was talking about forgiveness. Well, how many times do I need to forgive? Seven times. Well, that seems like a healthy amount. And Jesus said 70 times seven. Yeah. Which does not mean you're counting up to 490 times that I'll forgive someone, but unlimited. unlimited. And, and then and Jesus tells the story of a man who uh, had a tremendous burden and the, the, the king for, forgave him of his, of his debt. But then that man went out and and was offended and uh, he said, well, I'm gonna throw you in jail and he wasn't willing to forgive. I mean, he has been forgiven this huge burden, this huge debt, this, we could, we'd say sin in our own lives mm -hmm. and he wasn't willing to give that to his brother. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's probably one of the most challenging aspects of our faith in Christ is the idea of forgiving others. It's great in theory until you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a human tendency, do we not, to judge others because they're not like us? Oh, absolutely. Would you say? No, yeah. yeah. My question is, and I got a lot of questions about this one question, because <laughs> uh, I've always found, what's the circumstances behind this? I mean, is it an issue of somebody to, uh, confront you about a sin you were doing? Well, we don't like to be told we're sinful. And so now I'm mad, so I'm going to leave. How dare you tell me that I've sinned? Or did you come in halfway through a conversation that you heard part of it? Yeah, yeah. 
And, and I've had to deal with that before is, uh, well, they said this. And then I found out, talked to the people. Then I found out there was a whole bunch over here, but they only heard this much. Uh -huh. um, is there actual abuse in the church? Because the clergy can abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they can do that. Um, so there's just a lot of questions that I have mm -hmm. regarding this. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, you know, the scriptures come out and, and even talk about this in, in Matthew 18, where it says, if you've been offended, what's the first thing you're supposed to do when you're offended? You go to the person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't wait for that person who committed the offense to come and say, I'm sorry for doing it. They don't even know you, they did wrong. Yeah, yeah. you as the, as the offended one go to them. Yeah, and we don't like that. Yeah. And yeah. we don't want to do that. And that's the, that's usually one of the first things I ask people. And they say, you know, so-and-so did this. I said, did you talk to him about it yet? Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> okay, and now you want me to do your dirty work for you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, the scriptures say, you're to go to them. And then if they don't listen, then you bring someone else with you. And then if they still don't listen, then you take them before the congregation. Mm -hmm. And So there's a procedure. There is a procedure. Scripture. And Jesus, Jesus says that's, that's, yeah, right. that's Jesus the Jesus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the whole point of that is reconciliation. Right. I mean, it isn't confrontation. It isn't who's right and who's wrong. Jesus is very clear. It's the whole point is reconciliation. Yeah. Let's if I've offended you, let's let's bring it out in the open so we can yeah. discuss it so yeah. we can be one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, that's and a good I, point. And Excellent I have point. found out 90, 95 percent of the time it's a misunderstanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the not, most of the time it's a misunderstanding. And all it takes is somebody to take the first step and say, hey, there's a misunderstanding. Let's deal with it. I mean, even if it was a misunderstanding, there's times where people, we all sin. So, yeah, I might, I might have. There's, I find a lot of people have been legitimately hurt. I, to get around a group of pastors, you'll never meet more people hurt by the church. <laughs> I mean, you guys all know this. And so I don't ever want to minimize what they've been through. But a lot of times it's just they've never been given an opportunity to repent. That there's a lot of times, I mean, think of it in our own marriages, how many times we've said things that are hurtful to our children or to our spouses, mm -hmm. but we, we have an opportunity to make amends for those things. When you flee from the church or, or flee from that conflict or flee from the opportunity to go to them, um, you're, you're in some senses robbing them an opportunity to repent of what they might have legitimately done wrong. And, and so there might have been a, a legitimate grievance, a, a way you were spoken to, a way you were treated. Mm -hmm. um, um, but if you don't go to them, mm -hmm. if you just run from it, and then I think on the flip side for us as churches, we need to be places that, um, that people feel drawn into. I, I just always wonder when they say, I don't think I can go back. And I think, boy, I just feel like you haven't gotten a real experience of what the family of God, the fellowship of God mm -hmm. can be like if you're not longing to be a part of that. And that's yeah, partly sure. on, you know, church bodies that aren't, living and loving the way of Christ and loving one another and coming alongside one another. But I think we've all experienced, even when we've been hurt by church, that there's something special mm -hmm. in the family of God. There's something special about the church of Jesus Christ that hope, that draws us back in, that draws us, whether mm -hmm. it's to worship, whether it's to service, whether it's to just general fellowship. There's something kind of unique. And so maybe as a church, we really need to make sure we're a, a marked out place, a marked out people that doesn't just look like if I'm offended at the Eagles, I leave and I don't renew my membership. I hope that the church has a drawing power to, to, to bring people back in. Do you see a situation uh, in some cases whereby church politics can get in the way? I don't mean <laughs> regular politics, but church never. politics. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, never. no we, 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 we model our government after Jesus. Yeah, mm -hmm. We definitely do that. <laughs> and, and sometimes what happens is you, you may have a, let, let's come down to brass tacks, you may have a family that's a big giver in the church yeah. and feels that certain things ought to go certain ways. Yeah, yeah. And the person that is offended, on the other hand, really wants restitution for that issue, but maybe the family that's the big giver in that church and has a lot of political persuasion feels it ought to go another way. This is why it's important for there to be godly leaders in the church that are not the pastor. Such as elders, elders or whatever. Deacons and like. Um, this that's the one thing I like about uh, the church I currently serve is I, I've got godly men, 
And every church has got a, per, a prominent family. You're going to have that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I also know in the time I've been there that they have wrestled with hard questions and they were looking at scriptures and saying, this is what scriptures say, but, but that's part of the family. It doesn't matter. This is what scriptures say. You know, instead of uh, the leadership, I believe, uh, a leadership that's just voted on by the congregation versus leaders that are appointed and are trained. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, and I believe if they're trained and they're gonna take their responsibility very seriously. And I believe that they would be involved with um, you know, confronting if need be. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, a, this is a very high pressure issue when we get into this, the church politics and the like. And in some cases, we're finding that uh, among the carnage is pastors. <laughs> pastors who, who just say, I've had enough of the pressure. And in some cases, they wind up leaving the ministry altogether. On the far end of it, and, and you may have some stats on this, pastors who commit suicide. Mm -hmm. It can be just that serious. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about that, gentlemen? Well, I'll, I'll throw out the stats and I'll let the experts talk more about <laughs> it. <laughs> from uh, from soulshepherding.org uh, says 75% of pastors report being extremely stressed. 90% mm -hmm. work between 55 to 75 hours per week. 90% feel fatigued and worn out every week. 70% say they're grossly underpaid. 80% will not be in ministry 10 years later, and only a fraction make it a lifelong career. 70% um, say they have lower self-esteem now than when they entered ministry. Oh. And, and I think part of that is we're called to an impossible task. And when we- What do you mean by that? Well, you, you're, you're in an impossible situation of, of ministering to people um, and and thinking that we have to do it. A lot of times the churches, pastors fall into this same trap of comparing ourselves with others, mm -hmm. of, you know, what we call the three Bs. The uh, three Bs? Y yeah. Buildings, butts, and, you know. Uh, butts in the seats, you mean? But, butts in the seats, <clears throat> you, you know, and, and bucks. Oh. How, much, how much money comes in the offering plate? Huh. And, and when you use that as your standard, which is totally not what Jesus had in mind, uh, and, you, and you forget that our role is to make disciples. Mm -hmm. Our role is to raise up godly men and women who will be leaders, who can carry on the work. And when that's, when that's our paradigm, but the pressure from the outside world, the commercialized church, mm -hmm. or even the world at large, or um, even our own members, you know, who, who want bigger and better and think that that's the way it's supposed to be. The pressure can be daunting mm -hmm. and, uh, and you, can, you can just be overwhelmed by being the person everybody comes to to share their problems. And if you don't have proper Sabbath and you're not taking care of yourself and you're not in the word and you're not letting mm -hmm. Jesus shoulder the load as opposed to putting that on yourself, you'll burn out quick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Listen, I, I want to come back to another issue. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, I'd like to return with the issue is, what in the world is going on in the church that makes some pastors feel that the only solution for them is suicide? Think about that. We're going to address that in just a moment. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Welcome back to our program. We are putting you in touch with life's issues. The issue we have on the table right now, gentlemen, is what is it that could be so awful in the church that causes pastors to commit suicide? And we have, you know, we have stats on that. It's a real bona fide fact. What's happening in the church? Pastor Dim, now I'll, I'll ask you to turn on. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I used to be uh, 
chaplain of sheriff's departments and uh, fire departments and medics, and, and I've been on the suicide runs. I, I, I've been in there, I've been the first one in from time to time. And um, I, I see a, a couple things in some of them. One is a real strong desire to escape. Mm -hmm. I'm tired, I just want to escape. The other one is anger and revenge. Mm. Um, I've read the notes mm -hmm. and uh, where so-and-so is just really mad at so-and-so because they did this to me and how dare you stage the whole thing. I mean, I, when I'm talking about this, there's one particular, I can tell you exactly what color the chair was going in there and staged it, did this, did this, did this, and then took, took their life. Um, so, and then you've got the, the third element here and that's mental illness. And the church doesn't like talking about mental illness. I, I don't know when the last time you preached on it. I preached on it about a year ago on mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, and w when you're dealing with the garbage of the church or, and you don't have a way to get rid of it, uh, eventually the garbage truck has to unload. And how do you define garbage in that, in that context? Uh, I know, we're going to be careful. <laughs> the, 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 the stuff, the... the, the, the All you know, the life issues oh, people bring you as a pastor. Yeah, and they yeah. expect you to keep it. And then you will, uh, I, the way I describe it, it's like a garbage truck. It comes on. And then eventually the garbage truck is going to explode or you've got to find a way to let the garbage out. And... Um, Many pastors are very isolated. Mm -hmm. Most of us do not have really close friends. Or mentors. Or mentors, or, and you, maybe you have opened up to people in the church and that has come to bite you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people say, do you have anybody you talk to in the church? Nope. Wow. Notice how quickly I said that. Yeah, nope. Yeah, yeah. Why is it? Well, I've been bit. Sure. You share sure. this and then they come after you. So what is actually going on in the life of pastors that's causing them to do this? I don't know. I mean, but those are the three things. I'm going to get back at this church. How dare they do this to me? Or I just want to sleep. Mm. I just, I, I need to ex escape or I am just so lonely. And they're all saying, well, what about Jesus? What about God? I am so lonely. Look at the scriptures. There was depression in the scriptures. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Major. Major, major. Where you went under a broom tree, and I just want to die. Jonah. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Any other perspectives on this, gentlemen? Well, I, I would just say that I, I, there was a point in my life a few years back where, you know, I, I was at the place that if, uh, if I could have figured out a way to do it, that it wouldn't look like what it was, and I wouldn't hurt somebody else. Mm -hmm. I was ready to check out. Boy. Everything in life felt like it was falling apart. My wife uh, was was leaving, and uh, the church situation was uh, disrupted. My pay was increasing. I didn't feel like there was one Your state. Your pay was increasing. Well, no, no, my pay was being taken away because oh. of the of losing the church, oh. and um, I felt like everything was falling apart, that yeah. there was nothing solid left mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. And and I know there's a lot of people who, who wrestle with that, you know, the relationship issues, family life issues. And if it had not been for a few brothers that I could call mm -hmm. in the middle of the night when, uh, when I was in the throes of depression, mm -hmm. um, I, I probably would not have made it. I, I remember a particular, I had been I had my Bible and I, I just went and, and laid down in a prayer room, um, not because I was so spiritual, but because I didn't have anything else to go to. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just remember about two solid hours of nothing but crying to the Lord and, and tears. And, and, uh, and eventually what happened is, you know, I got up from that situation and, and it felt like the weight of the world was off of me. Hmm. Um, and you know, the Lord never gave me a word. Um, I still had to go through a divorce. I still had to go through um, 
all the questions of can I still serve the church? Can I still be a pastor? Will, will there, you know, does this change my life call? Uh, how's my family going to risk? I still had to go through the financial mess. I still had to go through all of that. Mm -hmm. God didn't take that step away, but the one I got up from that time of prayer, the one thing that I had was that the Lord mm -hmm. was always with me. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. if the people in whatever situation they're in, if they can just go back to the point where they recognize that Jesus died for you mm -hmm. and he's not going to leave you now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as pastors, we sometimes forget that. Right. And we need to be reminded just like everybody else. Can I, I want to add something to it too. Yeah. Suicide doesn't, doesn't have to be physical. Uh -huh. uh, there are pastors who will commit professional suicide. Define? Define, they will do something, they will get involved with a sin or something that they know would destroy their ministry, but they can't see any way out. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so they will literally sabotage their ministry because they're in such depression or whatever else, and I'm going to do this. Hopefully I will get caught, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. You, you go, were you going to read add? Well, I, I, I think... Even as a culture in general, we don't know how to cope with issues that come our way. We're not real good about coping. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we've lost maybe coping skills. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what I like what, what we've said here is, I think it's very, very important what you're saying is, is have somebody you can open up to mm -hmm. is really important. You know, you talk about the two brothers, you know, these brothers that you were able to go to. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's so important. We, we, if we keep it inside, it just builds. There's something about decompression when we can share it. Yes, we can share it with the Lord, but it's also good to share it with somebody that's got skin on. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. He, he, the Lord works through people. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and, that's and that important. relates back to the previous question about being hurt. I mean, what... Yeah and being afraid to go back to church. You know, it, why do we need the church? Well, we need the church because one, you can't, you can't live the life that God calls you to live outside of the church. That's true. Out, outside of the body, outside mm -hmm. of Christian fellowship. Yeah. Uh, and we need people around us yeah. to uh, walk with us. Yeah, absolutely. And to build into those relationships. I mean, that's the crucial part too. It's not just sitting at a worship service for an hour on a Sunday morning. You've got six more days and 23 more hours <laughs> in the week. Sure. And, and, and we're, we're so oftentimes stretched. Yeah. We're so busy. Now, how do we build into, into our lives relationships that are significant, that are important, that you can say, hey, who can I call at three o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. I think it's, that's an important question that we all need to answer. Yeah. Everybody seeing this, who do I have in my life that I could call at three o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. to have that kind of a person is important in our lives. Mm -hmm. it, you know, interestingly, it's so funny because with all social media and all the networking, mm -hmm. we're more disconnected now than yeah. we ever have. Yeah. And, you know, to the suicide notes and that type of thing, how often, uh, like with the students, uh, Delphus had a horrible run a few years mm -hmm. back with teen suicide in the school. And uh, it was the pleas that are put out on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, social media platforms, as they're checking out, you know, they'll send a, a mass text or they'll mm -hmm. do something. A cry for help. As a cry for help yeah. or, hey, I'm doing this, or there's red flags that people should be noticing. Um, and sometimes that alerts people and they can intervene, but, but sometimes yeah. it's just out there and, and it, we're not connected. Yeah, it just shows yeah. that they're, you know, they can have 500 Facebook friends, and, and yet they're making this plea for somebody to pay attention to them. H have we become so callous? Have we become so used to it? Has it become so commonplace in society that, uh, oh, well, another suicide? Is, is, is that part of the issue, you think? I just think people are wrestling so deeply with such big issues. Of their own? Yep. And, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, a young man at Bowling Green High School just this past week town I used to live in and many of the viewing area would still cover just uh, committed suicide yeah. um, and uh, and I'm seeing people post in the aftermath it's one of the things that people actually stop and hit pause on the noise for a second and they actually consider 
um, all of us have probably done an untimely death funeral, sure. ears are open. Yes. Mm -hmm. People stop and they oh, consider yeah. and they're listening in ways that they're never mm -hmm. listening at a, my grandfather passed last week, he was yeah. 85 years old. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a, a portion of your heart that is not open at a funeral of an 85 year old that yeah. is of a 17 year old, yeah. that is yeah. of a 23 year old so um, because it does cause us. So I don't know that it, we've become callous, um, but it, it certainly is something where we've, uh, we've lost the ability to speak to one another. We've lost the ability to connect. We're the most interconnected generation ever, I mean, quite literally, and we report the highest rates of loneliness ever, married and single. Mm -hmm. So as a people, we are the loneliest we've ever been, yet the most connected we've ever been. Mm -hmm. Bill, I think one of the things is that that opportunity is there, but there more and more people are disconnected mm -hmm. from, from church. I mean, you know, the, the statistics, about 17% of the population is in church on any given su Sunday. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, we have whole generations. That youngest yeah. generation is not connecting. And unless the church is actively reaching out to them and giving hope in these moments of crisis, um, it's going to perpetuate because the answers that they're getting from the culture aren't going to stop the tide. I, I look at uh, uh, Judas, who, of course, was a disciple, a follower of Christ. And then when he betrayed him with the 30 pieces of silver and he came, he came under conviction, he knew he had done wrong. He, at that time, had put so much distance between him and the Lord, he didn't come back and he did go out and commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Seems to me the answer would be if he had come back to Christ, certainly he would have been forgiven. I'm reminded of Moses uh, when Moses had taken the Israelites, uh, the Hebrews out of uh, Egypt and they were in the promised land or going to the promised land, and they had all these, uh, he became the judge, mm -hmm. and everybody kept coming uh, to him, right. kept coming to him, come, yeah. coming to him. Father, his father, father, finally his father-in-law went up to him and said, what are you doing? <laughs> I think that's the exact translation, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, You're, yeah. You've got too much going on. Once again, let's go back to what we said before. Mm -hmm. Train people yes. to take the load from you. Delegate. Delegate. Delegate, delegate, delegate. And uh, Moses started doing that. And it paid off. And, and it paid off. Yeah. I, and then I look at a battle when Moses' hands were lifted up and two people were on his side mm -hmm. lifting up. The, that, I think that's what we as a church have got to realize in the church, but also outside the church. Well, we're all out of time. I wish we could pursue this a little mm -hmm. further. Let me just say for our audience, uh, next week, we're going to have this same panel back and we're going to be discussing some other very pressing issues, including Sabbath, that is rest, mm -hmm. so that you don't have all these problems that are plaguing you and you can have time to rest from them. So stay tuned for next week's show when we come back uh, to deal with that issue and other issues. Mm -hmm. Until next week, I'm Bill Harris, and thank you for being with us for today. God bless you. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>